And uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's uh, delightful to be back on St. Helena. Um, I've been here many times, but it's always a great pleasure to, to come back. Um, so the title of my talk uh, is Ensuring the Survival of St. Helena's Cloud Forest. I'm going to go through a few things that I think are important in ensuring that. And uh, as I say, I'm from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And I'm going to show a few slides to start with just about uh, British Columbia and, and Vancouver and where I come from just to explain who I am. I used to work at the University of Edinburgh, but I, some years ago I went to the University of British Columbia. And because, um, you know, not, quite a lot of people don't know anything about uh, that part of the world. I'll just fill you in. This is um, um, Vancouver, a beautiful city on the West Coast. And... Uh, where I've arrowed, that's UBC, the university where I work. And in fact, my uh, apartment on the campus is, is just below that arrow. So that's where I, I live. And uh, um, I am a professor at the University of British Columbia. And these are some shots to show you. It is a, an enormous university. And it's very well known in North America, but less well known in, in Europe. So I, I just wanted to... So, so all those... Uh, all those buildings are university buildings, and, um, uh, and that's the Rose Garden, where we have our degree ceremonies and, and such like. And just to run through quickly, just to, um, to orient you, to explain myself, I'm going to give you a few bullet points, really, to blow the trumpet of my university. So I hope I'm going to get a pat on the back when I get back from the vice chancellor, <laughs> so I've done my duty. But it is a huge uni university. Uh, it's uh, several times the, the largest uh, um, UK university, which typically have about 15,000 students. The so UBC has about 50,000 students. And um, um, it's, uh, um, it's a highly ranked research university. And when I looked up on the web to see what, you know, there's, there's one thing we come out as ranked number one in the world. It, I didn't invent this. It's, it's the ranking agent, you know, the Times Higher Education Supplement. And that's for wildlife and fisheries management and conservation. And that's mainly because um, Daniel Pauly and Rashid Sumaila are two, the two most famous fisheries management and conservation experts in the world and uh, they've started you know they're responsible for a lot of the thinking about modern fish fisheries man management um, notable infrastructure i'd point out the bt biodiversity museum because i'm actually the the my second job is to be director of that so um, the bt biodiversity museum is a general natural history museum. We are Vancouver's natural history museum, as well as being a university museum. And um, it's a very important public uh, museum. We do a lot of educational programs. We also have uh, vast holdings of natural history. So uh, I employ curators in these areas, ma mainly in these collections. So we, we have uh, curatorial experts in bryophytes, lichens, fungi, marine algae, and vascular plants on the herbarium side. And uh, we have, uh, of course, curators in entomology, fish, and so on. So uh, I'm, I know that in St. Helena, um, there is a strong link to the Natural History Museum in London, and that's good. And I don't want to disturb that. But if, you, <laughs> if, if St. Helena has any queries, the Natural History Museum in London is, is in any way tardy at solving. Contact us, because <laughs> we, we might be able to help too. But anyway, that, that's enough about uh, me and my location and my raison d'etre. I now want to turn to St. Helena. And just to orient us about the ecological catastrophe that happened, I want to... By the way, this view is a view that's becoming... Uh, rarer because, of course, that was always the first view of the island for everyone arriving on St. Helena. Now it's a rather different view of the barn and, and so on, but, uh, but that, that's, that's the old view and uh, when one arrived by ship. And, of course, the reason um, for the start of the problem 
is the ecological disaster that started with the discovery of the island by the Portuguese in 1502. And this old illustration shows the Portuguese fleet um, back from, um, from um, Goa in India en route to Portugal carrying silks and spices back to Europe. And you can see uh, Jamestown there, Chapel Valley with the chapel and various fruit trees, date, three date palms, and so on. And on, on the hillside, you can see, actually, if you look closely, you can see goats perched on the crags and uh, Portuguese sailors with muskets trying to pot the goats. And it's the introduction of the goat by the Portuguese that was the start of the ecological disaster. And, of course, when the Portuguese discovered the island, um, it was thought to be a gift from Providence to the Portuguese to help them with their trade. But strangely enough, Providence had not supplied any goats on this island. So that had, there needed to be a little correction of, of the, 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 the gifts of Providence to add the goat. But uh, the goats soon bred up, and, and people know the story that when Thomas Cavendish visited in 1588, uh, he reported flocks of goats a mile long. And uh, there were no predators. Um, and of course, goat flocks, they, they, they tend to be, be a long string. So it's, it's not quite as, uh, it's not a mile wide, it's a mile long. But even so, that's a lot of goats. And of course, with the plant cover going, the soil's washed into the sea. And there are reports after storms um, that the sea turned black around the island. Uh, with the soil washed into the sea. And uh, that is, you know, I, I've been able to calculate the sediment load you need to see turbidity in water. The sediment load to turn the sea black is so huge <laughs> that it beggars belief. Uh, but that's what the island records tell us. The sea turned black after storms. And so the soils just went. So this is an old photograph of Lot's wife in 1980. Um, there's precious little vegetation at all. Um, the original vegetation has just gone. But funnily enough, it looks very different now because the crown wastes are actually healing themselves. Nature is finding a way to heal the crown wastes. But unfortunately, they're being healed by wild mango which really isn't, isn't anybody's first choice of plant to heal the crown waste because it's a bit of a nuisance. And uh, uh, it would be nice if, uh, if it was ebony's rather than wild mango. But anyway, that, so there is an amazing amount of vegetation spreading now on the crown, crown waste. But uh, that starts the ecological apocalypse, what I call the ecological ap apocalypse. Then it started to climb the mountain because the next phase was settlement. So in the mid 17th century, of course, set settlers arrived in St. Helena. The Great Fire of London, which displaced so many people, was a, an enormous driver to, get, it, it, to find somewhere for the displaced from the Great Fire of London to settle. And St. Helena was one, one place. And the early settlers had no timber except for the endemic flora. The cabbage trees and the redwood and the olive were chopped down to build houses. And if you've ever wondered why the early settlers' houses are so long and narrow, it's because to put a roof on, you need to have timbers that go across. And so the width of the early separate settler houses tells you how tall the cabbage trees grew, which is actually much taller than they grow now, because there's been, uh, the, the endemics are not what they were. They have been reduced by genetic erosion, which I, I will talk about late, later. But uh, when I came to the island in the 80s, I made a point of looking at the old houses to try and find remnants of the endemic flora that were still as 
um, uh, fireplace lintels, door lintels, window li uh, lintels, and so on. And uh, some of the old ruins actually yielded endemic plants, as, which probably dated from early settlement times, which is pretty amazing. And it's amazing to see these enormous trunks of cabbage tree, um, uh, of sheet cabbage, that, that are just inconceivable now. But they were they're clearly, I had these identified by Q, they were clearly uh, cabbage tree. But you never find pieces of, of, of wood that size. Um, but anyway, so much of the middle elevations were, were cleared. The redwood, uh, we know the, 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 the redwood was the only tree on the island which was tannin rich enough to tan hides. So the early settlers, when they killed a, a cow, they obviously wanted the leather. They, they skinned the, the, the cow. What do you tan it with? Well, redwood was the only one. So they would, uh, they would chop down redwood trees, strip off the bark, and use that to tan the, the leather. And of course, the destruction of the redwood was absolutely colossal. Uh, for, for tannin. Then, of course, flax comes in, and the last remaining bit of the natural vegetation on s slopes too steep for pastures, too high to trouble with, were perfect for flax. And huge acres of remaining cabbage tree woodland and tree fern thicket were just destroyed for flax plant planting. And flax was king. It was economically enormously important. It supported the island. So everybody wanted uh, flax. Ironically, now, the cabbage trees are economically more important for tourism than the flax. So things have flipped. <laughs> and we rather wish we'd been left with more cabbage trees, which would be more valuable now. Um, but anyway, um, that's to, to go on. Um, what is left after these three phases of ecological apocalypse? We, what we have is Diana's Peak National Park and, and High Peak. And uh, it's the only intact functioning natural ecosystem. And what do I mean by functioning? Well, what I mean f by functioning is that it's, it's many species which are interacting and there's a full trophic level. In other words, the plants produce leaves, the leaves are decomposed by fungi and insects, and then other insects eat those insects. So there's a, there's a web of intellect, ecological interactions which remains. Whereas in other places, you can go and find some endemics in the crown waste. You can find a scrub wood or something. But there's not really an intact functioning ecosystem any, any, anymore. There's, those ecological interactions just aren't present. So this is really important because it's the one place where you can see how the ecosystem functioned um, and, and still, still, still functions. Uh, so um, it is of, of enormous importance for that reason. But of course, it's, it's, uh, it's under threat. Um, and so I thought I'd just summarize for you what are internationally recognized as the main drivers of extinction, particularly plant extinction, because that's what I'm interested in, worldwide. And these are direct habitat loss, in other words, deforestation, people going in with chainsaws, clearing land, and so on. Well, yes, St. Helena's had that. It, it had it long, long ago. Nobody's going in with chainsaws now to clear the cabbage tree woodland. Uh, we're past that. But we had it. Overexploitation. Yes, the redwood and the gumwood were overexploited. And so <coughs> they went. So we, we had that. But it's not, it's not a problem anymore. We're past that. Invasive species. Well, yes. So 1850 to about the year 2000, um, the, uh, there were large numbers of invasive species um, introduced right up to the agroforestry programs of the 1970s. People were, were introducing dry land um, invasives to try and, try and put the crown waste back together and so on. Um, and this is still a major problem, but it's kind of being solved by the ingenuity, skill, and knowledge of these guys, the peaks teams. 
the people who are up there doing it because they're realizing how they can outwit the invasives. They're realizing that if one starts establishing a thick, um, a thick understory of ferns, the invasives won't come in. And then you can put the cabbage tree in. So by trial and error, experience, skill, smarts, the, the invasive problem can be beaten by these guys and all the other, not just those people in the picture, but all the, all the other uh, great people who are working up, up on the peaks. What else have we got? Well, genetic collapse, and I put it in bold because I'm going to be talking more about that tonight. And what's an example of genetic? Well, I think the St. Helena olive is an example. It's extinct. Why did it become extinct? Well, there was one, it was rare for a long time, and there was one left. But that one olive left had a problem in that it needed another one to cross-pollinate it. And so very few seed were set by that, that last individual. So that's an example of rarity uh, engendering more rarity, because simply because um, you can't... There, there are some seats down at the front. Come, 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 come. come. Uh, so, um, the uh, uh, genetic collapse I'm going to talk more about. Um, spread of disease. Disease is an extinction driver, um, and we have that uh, here. I'll talk more about that. Climate change is potentially a driver of extinction, but we don't know which way that is going to bounce. Um, it could be... Uh, I've, looked at the, I've, tried, I've looked at the models and tried to make sense of them, and the upshot for me is that we don't have any reliable models at the moment for whether St. Helena is going to get wetter or drier. Depends upon what happens to the intertropical convergence zone, and uh, uh, we just don't know at the moment. Um, but potentially that is um, a, um, an extinction driver. The final one is the only one that St. Helena hasn't had, which is asteroid impact. And um, uh, that's, that's this kind of thing. You will remember probably that um, um, the most likely explanation for the extinction of the dinosaurs is the uh, the ecological devastation engendered by a major asteroid impact on the Yucatan Peninsula um, in the uh, um, late Jurassic, early Cretaceous. And uh, that asteroid impact, of which this is uh, a, a contemporary managed to snap a photograph here of, of it happening, um, of course, occurred long before St. Lena even existed. So we haven't had that one, but uh, historically it's very, very important. And, um, but I hope we don't get an asteroid impact uh, of uh, that magnitude uh, anytime soon. Um, I've got too much to do to worry about asteroid impacts, to be honest. Uh, anyway, I, I'm gonna, so my role in the Cloud Forest project is to tackle this, uh, the problem of the genetics, because these plants are in extremely small populations. Many of them have been in small populations for a very long time. And we believe that some of the endemics are mere shadows of what they were because of inbreeding. And I'm gonna give you an example to get you, uh, get you thinking about this, and that's the example of the redwood. Now, we know that the redwood, uh, because of its use in tanning, tanning, use in building, was uh, more or less extirpated very, very early. And this is a, but a few big specimens remain. This is a drawing by Birchall of the great redwood tree at Longwood, and uh, is obviously a big tree. Those are gumwood trees in the background, obviously. Um, and there's a gumwood tree drawn to the side. Now, you know, you can get a rough idea of the scale. This was a big tree. And, you know, I, redwood now doesn't seem to be showing much sign of developing into trees of that size. But, you know, we can hope. Um, but 
this is, um, this is the sort of redwood that we had. When I visited in 1980 and the early 80s, I was horrified by the state of the redwood because this is a, on, on the right is a tree that used to sit outside the, um, the office of the agriculture and forestry officer at the time. And it was a redwood um, that was used for seed collection to grow the next generation of red, redwoods. But when the seeds dropped and started growing, or if people grow them, grew them, they reached about that size on the left. The leaves went yellow and the plants died. It was extremely difficult to get the plants to survive. And this is, I interpreted this as lethal genes exposed by, um, by inbreeding, really making the genetic stock extremely poor. So I went back to the UK and said, this is a problem we've got to solve. And I looked for a, a bright, enthusiastic student to take this on. And I found such a student and um, her name was Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca Rowe at that time. She later became Rebecca Cairnswix, and many of you may know her. She came out to St. Helena, and I gave her the task of genetic rescue of the redwood. And I said to her, I want one day to be able to stand under a canopy of redwood, which was, obviously, that, that was only about four feet high. You couldn't stand, stand un, 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 under it. And that was all the redwood was doing. The reason for the collapse of the redwood, um, I think because the redwood went down to a single tree. It's a single tree at um, Peak Gut Waterfall. And Norman Williams, the, uh, the then forestry officer here, he would go and collect seed from Peak Gut Waterfall and grow it. This is back in the six, 50s and 60s. And there are one or two trees were established. That one, one at Mount Pleasant, one at Teutonic Hall, they all came from this single individual. And if you took seed from just one of these, you got this genetic collapse. So I said, well, why don't we cross the remaining individuals, which are all spread out over the island? Rebecca did that. And I believe that she rescued the redwood. And the only reason we have the redwood now is because of her work. Um, I'll give you a little bit of, uh, so this is, I mean, of course, it's difficult to, to estimate the, um, the original size of the redwood population. I estimated about 10,000 on this graph, but we, we don't really know. Might have been higher, might have been lower. But we see the collapse in, at the end of the 17th century. This is a logarithmic scale, so it goes down 10,000, 1,000, 110, one, boom. And that should have been it. That should have been extinction. But by very carefully marshalling all the, the, the peak gut waterfall plant died, so, so that original genetic stock was finished. But its progeny somehow had to be brought together to get the best gene combinations to make that lineage survive. And um, it was done. Uh, Rebecca did it. I think it's an it's a enormous achievement. And it may, for me, it made it uh, um, evident that there was a huge importance of genetic rescue, the crossing of one population. One, you know, in the Redwood, we were crossing isolated. We were actually taking pollen from Scotland to Mount Pleasant or Mount Pleasant to Teutonic Hall and so on. The, 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 the Teutonic Hall one actually died very, uh, I think it was, it had died before Rebecca reached the island, but there were, there were some progeny from that. So marshalling all those resources, managed to rescue it. And then my view of this was confirmed in 2015 by this study where Richard Frankham, a great uh, conservation geneticist, had put together all the studies he could find on the genetics of rare plants and concluded that in all the studies where this, is, this had been done, like Rebecca's, there had been large and consistent benefits of gene flow. In other words, 
somehow connecting isolated small populations, you've got better genetics and better survival. So armed with this idea, you know, it became clear that genetics were extremely important in conservation. And how should we apply this to the Cloud Forest Project? Well, um, there is a caveat here in that if the populations are evolutionarily distinct, we shouldn't force them together because we'd lose the distinctiveness. But if they're just remnant parts of a single continuous population, then we desperately need to bring them together. So um, the Barsa Gumwood, where we had two surviving individuals and were able to combine the genetics from two surviving individuals, um, uh, the plantain and the rosemary, um, these are cases where bringing plants together can have genetic benefits. But there are other plants, and the Diana's peat grasses, where, where there seems to be evolutionary differentiation between different, um, different populations. And the population of Diana's peat grass on the barn is really completely different, which is very interesting. And we'll return to that later, because the barn is a very extraordinary place. And uh, it's an island within an island. But uh, that, that could be revisited. So how do we do this? I mean, uh, for those who are not familiar with a genetics lab, it's really the art, you know, doing DNA work is the art of moving very accurately measured minute quantities of liquid from one tube to another, and then uh, performing some um, technical operations on that. So, and what you get out is uh, on the bottom left, either sequence data, <coughs> which is DNA sequences, you know, how the DNA uh, strings uh, are, are, are composed, or um, different fragments of DNA that move on uh, a gel at different rates when you put an electric current over it. So these are the types of data that we're dealing with. And so for the Cloud Forest project, I was able to start looking at some of the endemics looking for variation, looking to see what was going on. And I'll give you two, although it's still work in progress, I'll give you two examples of which I think are stand out as, as really sort of uh, staggering findings, really. Um, so on uh, the left, we have the lobelia. And uh, many of you are familiar with this plant. It's a peak endemic, but interestingly, uh, there seems to be some strong differentiation between populations on the, uh, on the peaks uh, in different parts of the ridge. So I've been able to do some more sampling on this visit, and we're going to try and work out exactly where this variation is present and, and what, it's, uh, uh, what the main centers of variation are, and to try to find out whether this is just um, variation that will allow us to bring these populations together and improve the variation of the genetic stock, or whether they're truly evolutionarily distinct and so should be kept apart. This is one of the key questions. So on the right is the small kidney fern, Dryopteris napoleonis, if you want the, the, the fancy name, and it's present on the peaks. So the upper picture is Dryopteris napoleonis growing on Diana's Peak. The lower picture is Dryopteris napoleonis growing on the barn. And we thought that they were just the same, but it turns out that the one that grows on the barn is genetically completely different to, well, not completely different, very different from the one on Diana's Peak. So they should be treated definitely as separate entities. But it brings back this extraordinary um, fact that the barn is very, very special. It has extraordinary things on it. It has what we thought was Diana's peat grass. It turns out to be something unique to the barn. It has small kidney fern. 
it's unique to the barn. It's a type unique to the barn. So I, I see the barn as an island within an island. It's got sea on two sides and it had dry gumwood woodland surrounding it on the other two sides, making it an isolated island. And who knows what was on it. You see the cloud hanging over the barn regularly. I wonder whether there was, a, there was actually a lot of vegetation, even wetland, because if there was vegetation there, it would increase the cloud cover and so on. I think the barn is, uh, is a very, very special place for the island. Um, so I'll just finish this, this bit on genetics just by saying, can we have our cake and eat it? Yes, we can establish new plantings with interbred stock, maximizing genetic variation. So rosemary, there are two remaining populations, Lot and High Hill. Well, they're, they're very similar. There's, no reason, there's every reason to believe they're just remnants of a once continuous distribution of rosemary. They're not distinctive in any way. So we can bring them together. But just in case there's something special about the lot population or the high hill population, one doesn't have to plant mixed stock in those places. Establish um, interbred stock everywhere else, but leave lot and high hill alone, just in case there's something special which we haven't detected about those populations. That's fine. Uh, so, and we can also seed bank the original populations. So we don't have to worry too much about the original populations. We can mix them up because Vanessa Thomas-Williams in her seed bank in Scotland has the original stock seed banked at low temperature, low humidity. And the, uh, the seed banking work that's being done at Scotland, um, helped by the Millennium Seed Bank at Kew, is really first class and uh, gives a fantastic insurance policy uh, for the island and its endemics. Uh, so um, I'm now going to go on to the question of disease. Disease is a known extinction driver. So what's happening on St. Helena? Well, um, plants have an immune system, not the same as the human immune system, but analogous to it. But genetic variation is very important for that immune system. And so I, I've, um, years ago, I wrote an article warning about the problems of low genetic variation on susceptibility to disease in very rare populations. And uh, unfortunately, it's turned up in St. Helena. Uh, which is, is very unfortunate. But some soils, as I say here, may lack the harmless but aggressive microorganisms that keep pathogens at bay. And because St. Helena is an isolated island, that may apply to, to St. To Helena. Environmental stress, pests, drought, waterlogging, competition from invasives may make weaken plants and make their immune system less effective and uh, less able to resist disease. And so we all know that pests, drought, waterlogging, and competition from invasives are all things that occur on St. Helena and affect all the plants here. So um, this is something that, uh, that is going to be a factor. And importantly, pathogens come not as single spies, but in battalions. The, when one pathogen weakens a plant, then it means that other pathogens, which would normally be kept out by the immune system, can invade. So very often one sees a, um, a guild of pathogens attacking and killing plants. So it's, it's not just one. You have to think about all the pathogens that are going to be attacking. So let's have a look at what's going on. So we have on the peaks what um, I call cabbage tree sudden death syndrome. And it may be caused by several diseases, uh, and so on. So it, it, that, this is why I call it a syndrome. Uh, I'm being deliberately vague. But this has been known for a while. In 2016, Phil Lambden and Shayla Ellick wrote a very important and groundbreaking report and noted in that 
that in 2008 and 2014, a wave of death occurred during warm, dry conditions following a period of sustained heavy rain. Now, that should have been a clue because that's very typical of Phytophthora um, uh, infestation, which I will talk about later. In 2021, um, there was an EMD workshop on uh, disease. And in July, Rebecca Canswicks and Vanessa Thomas-Williams authored an extremely important report that really awakened our, the, us to the severity of this. Is it entitled, Is Disease Affecting the Health of Cloud Forest Cabbage Trees and Their Associated Biota? A summary note and call to action. And it worked because action, <laughs> action happened. And in 2022, there was positive identification by CABI in the UK of a Phytophthora. And for those who, don't, who are maybe not plant pathologists, um, those of you who are unfortunate enough not never to have attended a plant pathology course at university, but um, um, the uh, Phytophthora is one of the most feared of all plant diseases. The very name, Phytophthora, is Greek for plant destroyer. And there are many, many species of Phytophthora. And uh, you may remember the Irish potato famine, which killed a million people and caused a million more to emigrate to the United States, changed human history forever. That was a Phytophthora, a particular Phytophthora of potatoes. So it's a, it's a nasty thing. It, it's really the Ebola of, if you know that, that, that terrible D disease. It's really the Ebola of the plant world. And uh, um, it's actually not a fungus. It's actually a, um, unrelated to fungus. It's a, what's called a water mold. It actually has, it's, it has some significant differences from, from fungi. But, it, but it's people who study fungi usually study this as well. So, so it's sort of an honorary fungus. But it's here. There are other diseases here as well. Um, I've just heard um, the, the, the latest from a, uh, from a team that's, that's visiting. Vanessa told me that, uh, uh, that other diseases have been identified on the peak. So the, this idea of a guild of diseases where one disease may weaken the plant and other diseases may hop on is, is important. And this is, this is what's going on on the peaks. Uh, this is from the... Uh, Kenswick's and uh, Thomas Williams report of 2021. I borrowed these pictures. You can see uh, the sudden death of magnificent uh, black cabbage trees here. Black cabbage is, the, is an ecological cornerstone species. It's, it's really important for the ecosystem of the peaks. And, but, uh, but the disease also affects uh, whitewood and he cabbage. So how can we deal with this? Well, there are very fortunately, this, this disease um, in its various forms has been well studied. So at the moment in the UK, there is a massive outbreak on the tree larch. So larch was 5% of the forestry in the UK. Larch is now 0%. And that's happened in a few years because of a strain of Phytophthora, not the same as our one, but another strain of Phytophthora, has basically destroyed the larch trees of the United Kingdom, um, either through direct death or people felling the larches as a precaution, as a prevention to stop the disease spreading. So this is, this is a known disease. It has been studied. There are various things one can do. Uh, these things are being looked into and applied by the, the appropriate um, uh, bodies on St. Helena. So I, I think we can beat this. Uh, we can push it back. We, we can avoid spreading it and, and so on. Uh, uh, but it's just, a, it's just a nuisance. It's a big bump in the road to, uh, to achieving uh, the, um, the perfectly achievable and superb aims of, uh, of increasing and securing the future of the cloud forest. So I want to end just with a sort of a note that you have permission to tune out completely. So I'm going to explain 
plant immunity to you. Now, plant immunity is quite complex, and much of it has been um, worked out in the last decade. Uh, so, if you don't want to, to do this bit, just relax and think about your favorite thing for five minutes while I just go through this. So, uh, here we have, um, our, this, is, this cartoon helps us visualize how plant immunity works. On the left is the pathogen, might be a fungus or a phytophthora, um, and the plant can actually smell the fungus coming because the fungus actually releases some chemicals, bits of its cell wall, mole molecules seep out of the fungus. The plant can detect those. It's like it's smelling the fungus. And that causes those, those little molecules that come from the fungus attached to receptors on the wall of the plant cell. And uh, those receptors are called PRRs, which stands for Pattern Recognition Receptors. So, and uh, that triggers, as soon as the plant smells the fun fungus, the bits of, of the fungus are actually uh, meet the receptor, the receptor that, uh, that actually receives that signal. Then that triggers a cascade which activates defense genes. And the plant defense genes can, def if, if they're, they're healthy, the plant defense genes can, uh, can destroy the fungus, can stop, stop the fungus invading. But unfortunately, the fungus has a trick. Otherwise, if, if that was, was all, then there'd be no pathogenic fungi. The trick is that the pathogen then pumps out other molecules which actually stop the triggering of defense genes. And these are called effectors. And so the pathogen pumps out its effectors which stop the activation of defense genes. So the plant then has to have another mechanism to recognize the effectors. And as soon as the plant recognizes the effectors using things called NLRs, then if the plant recognizes the effector, it will also activate the defense genes. So it's a kind of battle between the plant and the fung fungus uh, because the plant cannot have its defense genes activated all the time because these defense genes cause real problems to the plant. So if they're activated all the time, the plant won't grow pro properly. So it only activates it when it activates these defense genes when it needs it. And that's when it, when it smells the fungus and can receive it with those receptors or where it can recognize fungal effectors within the cell. And, but my point is that the plant needs genetic variation in order for this to work because there are many, many um, microbe-associated molecular patterns. So the plant has to have a full range of things detecting the fungus, and a full range of N NLRs to, defect, to detect the effectors within the plant cell. And inbreeding can reduce the, the diversity of the immune system. And when that happens, the plant becomes susceptible to disease. And this is what I call the, the, the rarity immunity uh, linkage. And I have a suspicion that our, many of our endemic plants may be especially vulnerable because of their rarity and low genetic base. Anyway, I just want to finish with this slide, a nice slide of, of St. Helena's wonderful, um, wonderful cloud forest. And I put there two Latin words. And this comes back to what I was saying before, at the start of the lecture. This is the motto of my university, the University of British Columbia. And it means, it is yours. Est is it is, and tuum is yours. It's actually the Latin syntax is back to front. So, it's rather, it, the, the, the Romans spoke a little bit like uh, Yoda in Star Wars. Yours it is. Um, and 
many people think, well, that's a strange motto to have. It's yours. But it's meant, I think, in a sense that it's yours to mess up or yours to do something with. We offer you an education. Well, it's yours to either take it and use it or to spend every evening in the bar. Make your choice. And I think it applies in a way to the cloud forest in St. Helena. It's yours. Well, of course, it belongs to St. Helena. It's on St. Helena. But I think it means more than that. It's St. It's Saint, it's Saint Helena's to ensure the survival of. The FCDO, in all its might and majesty, can't ensure the survival. Not even the mighty Q can ensure the survival. If the cloud forest survives and thrives, it will be because of the skill, the passion, and the dedication of St. Helenians. To your best. Thank you. Well, I, I think the, the cloud forest does need active management because there are threats. And if left to itself, you know, in the long run, invasives will spread and problems will arise. Um, but I think it, it's, uh, the PEAKS team now has um, the measure of what it takes to reverse that process and actually increase the area. And magnificent work is going on actually putting the whole process of rarity into reverse gear and spreading it. The disease thing is a bump in the road, but I believe that, um, um, that through the management that's going on at the moment, uh, it, it will be possible. The grand vision is to spread cloud forest much more widely along the central ridge because that has big uh, implications for more water management on the island for a start and Ben here has been instrumental in showing the importance of the cloud forest for water management. So the future is good if we can just solve this wretched disease pr problem which is annoying uh, but I would say that um, one bright thing on the horizon is we've learned recently the importance of ferns in restoration because establishing a thick fern thicket is very resistant to invasives. And ferns, delightfully, are completely immune to most plant diseases. So they're the perfect thing to get on with. Um, and why is that? Uh, why are ferns immune? It's a, very, it's a very good question. I mean, I think... Um, uh, ferns have a number of, of chemicals in, in them, which are specific to ferns, uh, which, um, which seem to be very powerful in suppre suppressing um, um, plant diseases. But also, um, ferns are relatively rare in, in plant ecosystems. If you look around, you see mainly flowering plants, trees. Um, wild mango, pine trees, other, other um, things that aren't ferns. So plant diseases have gone for the commonest things, which are the flowering plants and seed plants. And so the, 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 all the adaptation that would need to go on to attack ferns hasn't really happened because well, there are so many flowering plants to uh, to try and kill. <laughs> so, so, so it's about the reproduction systems very being very different. Because. Yes. So I, I, I think well um, that that's that's part of it. But I also think the biochemistry is important. Ferns ferns are biochemically very different. Fungi perhaps could evolve to to attack uh, more ferns, but they're so good at attacking flowering plants, and flowering plants are more common. I think that, that's why we see this difference. But it's a very good point. I don't think anybody really knows, to be honest. Quentin, you've suggested that we should have a 
suggested that part of the recovery of this is to expand the area where we're planting mm. these plants. Mm -hmm. So does that therefore follow what you're saying about the ferns? We should plant these trees, but also plant some ferns around with them as well to help as a protective. Yeah. I, I think absolutely. And I think maybe plant the ferns first get and, and get them established push back the invasives. You, I mean, the wonderful thing is that the brown scale fern and the black scale fern are very big, relatively fast growing ferns that form a really thick mass that can keep white weed out. And so establishing the ferns, one can then insert the trees later. And I think that's, a very, that's something that uh, that the, um, that the Peaks team has really learned through uh, trial and error and, and just being clever about, about what they're doing. And uh, I think they, they deserve a lot of credit for that. So are there a lot of these ferns about? Because if they're so efficient, they're getting rid of the white weed. I'd like that, please. <laughs> yes, well, I, I think one of the problems is that, uh, you know, with a flowering plant, one can propagate them by seed. Now, ferns don't have seeds. They have, a, as has been said, a different reproductive system. It's much more difficult. But, um, very, Vanessa knows what I'm going to say now. Um, uh, uh, with help from Q, a fern reproduction lab has been set up at Scotland with the aim of eventually mass producing ferns. Uh, it's a more difficult task than mass producing flowering plants from seed. But it's possible, and the, the equipment now is at Scotland, um, and uh, um, we're very hopeful that we can mass produce ferns to start pushing back the, the invasives by establishing these, these, these peaks, peaks ferns. Is it possible to predict the pathogens and be prepared for it, mm -hmm. like having vaccines mm -hmm. for plants? Yes. So, um, uh, plant vaccination is, is something that uh, isn't really possible at the moment. People are thinking about it, but it would really be impossible to apply anyway in a natural environment. It could be done in agriculture. But um, there, are, um, there are ways in which one can certainly in controlled environments like a nursery, like the, in Scotland, one could use fungi which are non-pathogenic but are hostile to pathogens. So there are such things, um, there's a fungus called trichoderma, which is a harmless fungus, but it, it's very good at mopping up any resources that are around. So it'll grow and deplete the environment for um, deplete the resources for pathogenic fungi. So the pathogenic fungi then have a more difficult time. So that's, that, that's one uh, way. Um, also, you know, growing plants to a very high standard, you know, giving them good fertilizer, good conditions, then the immune system is at the very top of its game. You know, if, if you have plants that are very healthy, they're not going to suffer from disease because they have, um, they're able to resist. If you stress your plants, too, too little nutrient or too much drought or something like that, then the pathogens can get in. Waterlogging of soils, things, things like that. So uh, yes, there are certainly ways of dealing with this. And one thing I would say is that all we have to deal with is the pathogens that are here already, because now we have excellent biosecurity. The biosecurity has come to St. Helena too late, <laughs> so, so there, are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of horses which got out, out of the stable before it was bolted, <laughs> but it's, it's better late than never. And I think it's so important to have really strict biosecurity because we don't want any more pathogens, we don't want any more pests, we don't want any more mosquitoes, we don't, we don't want any more of these things, and they're out there in the world waiting to come in if we are asleep at the wheel. But I, when I land at St. Helena Airport and I see the biosecurity team there, I feel like going up to, and I would recommend, 
please, everyone, when you land at St. Helena Airport, go up to the biosecurity team, shake them by the hand, and say thank you for the wonderful work you're doing, because that is going to keep St. Helena free of the next things that will make St. Helena life miserable if you let them in. <laughs> make it more difficult to grow food, make it more, um, make life generally more unpleasant. So support your biosecurity team. I was quite interested in, in your early days here. Mm. I think you said nine, early 80s. Yeah, it? yeah. Um, the, the cabbage tree, mm -hmm. the wood being used in buildings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, do you know if those buildings are protected in any way? Are those yeah. timbers still here? No, I, I think the, um, when I look, so in, in 19, um, in, in, in 1982, when I went round with George, I asked, I talked about this with George Benjamin, and I, I, who I worked with at the time, and I, I said, look, we need to find, um, you know, which endemics were, were used in the early settler houses uh, hundreds of years ago. You know, are there, are there any remnants of uh, these early settler houses? And of course, there are many ruins, as, as we know. And for, one of the wonderful things is that many of these houses are now being rebuilt and, re and are no longer ruins, and that's great. But then, on the windward side of the island, all those old settler houses were ruins. So George and I were able to, uh, to get the landowner's permission and go to these ruins. And I drew very careful uh, ground plans of men, many of them. And we looked at the remaining fragments of timber that hadn't rotted away completely, in the, that were formed, the window lintels and so on. And that, that was, I took samples and sent them back to the to queue for, for confirming the identification of endemic wood. And, you know, but those timbers were, were rotting away and there's no, you know, so the first thing anybody would do in trying to rebuild one of those ruins would be to rip out that timber. Um, so I, I, I have no, um, you know, I, 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 um, I think it's just inevitable. But I'm glad I was able to, to go and, and make some notes on what was being used at the time. And there are still, you know, um, the house at um, Lower House Plain, Lower House Plain House, I think that may still be a ruin. I don't think anybody's rebuilt that. And, and that had some marvelous timbers in it. They're, they're probably all gone now. But, uh, but it would be interesting, again, to look at some of the houses that still are ruin and see whether you can still find fragments of 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 timber i mean it wasn't all and you know you could sometimes find um pine which may have been island pine uh, governor beatson started planting pine in the uh, in the early uh, early 19th century or it could have been imported pine but uh, but there were some of the houses still still retained endemic timber which i found fascinating and, and it still survived um, in houses that, that had only, um, only collapsed, fa at least fairly recently. It would be interesting to follow that up, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. It would. Yeah. Mm.